suggests that the residents should be supplied with plastic bags so they could help clean up after themselves. I'm not in charge of the municipality and it's them. If, uh, you know, I can ask them to come, it is up to them to send the people, um, which I am in touch with them most of the time. And, you know, I cannot, I haven't got the authority to say, do this, do that. I can always escalate the problems that we do have about our refuge, which I do. Refuse collection is a weekly occurrence in most areas, but for the people of Angelo informal settlement, this basic service remains a dream. Neria Shakota, NN7, Boxburg. Well, the annual African Investigative Conference gets underway at DeWitt University today. The Power Reporting three-day meeting is about the sharing of ideas by journalists with up-and-coming reporters also in the industry. Now, content production is the key component of the, the discussion. Uh, I'm now joined in studio by one of Angola's iconic journalists and uh, well-known for his watchdog reporting, Rafael Marx de Marais. Uh, Rafael, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you Do you come much. to South Africa a lot? Uh, not quite often, yeah. as I would like. Uh, but do you follow South African media uh, uh, at all uh, in the coverage of certain stories? I do, and actually I used to, some time ago, be a commentator for SABC Africa, and I also wrote for some uh, South African mm. newspapers. Mm. So I'm quite familiar with, uh, uh, with the South African media landscape, mm. and I have been following also Mm. Uh, the, the tensions it has been facing in trying to push and maintain that space of uh, freedom of press and mm. freedom of expression. Mm. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, this uh, three-day conference, uh, the program. It looks fascinating. Obviously, a lot of issues are uh, being covered. Take us through some of the main sort of workshop issues. Uh, let me just uh, tell you that one of the major problems we face, uh, particularly if you look at Southern Africa, is that that space for freedom is shrinking. Take the case of Zimbabwe, take the case of uh, Swaziland where there's a journalist in, ja uh, in jail just for uh, serving on a two-year sentence uh, for criticizing the lack of independence in the judiciary. So these are the problems we're facing, not just the professional problems of trying to do our job, but essentially how politicians are trying to uh, tamper with that space for freedom of expression mm. and the consequences uh, it has for society. Mm. So my main point uh, in this conference is how can we journalists uh, be more vocal, provide more solidarity to one another, mm. uh, particularly in countries like Swaziland, Zimbabwe, mm. and foremost in Ethiopia where the last independent journalists have been arrested and Ethiopia has the seat of the African Union mm. and very little is said about it. How can we really be talking about mm. uh, African Union, how Pan-Africanism, when the country that hosts this very ideal is so mm. repressive mm. and has very little criticism from uh, journalists around the continent and from politicians. Mm. Uh, so I think we have to be more proactive mm. in pushing the boundaries for free press not just in our countries, but across Africa. Mm. I guess we, when you compare it to the likes of the Middle East, uh, um, we have, as you said, maybe it's n maybe not as sort of dangerous if you look at some of the, uh, or, or is it not publicized that uh, there's a lot of danger for journalists in Africa as opposed to the Middle East? There's a lot of dangers for, jur uh, for journalists in Africa. Mm. It's just not publicized. Mm. Uh, that's the main difference. Yeah. Uh, just to give you an example, mm. last year, uh, September last year, I was arrested for covering a trial outside the courtroom. Mm. And I was beaten up uh, by the police and the, my... Is this in Angola? In Angola, yes, 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 yes. And I was covering the trial of uh, nine protesters who had been arrested. Twenty minutes later, after they were set free by the court, they were rearrested with me and locked up in jail. And then during their trial, <laughs> new trial, the judge set a bail of $24,000 and said, well, since you were speaking to Mr. Rafael Marquez, he must pay your bail. And I had to campaign along with the civic organization to get the money to pay for their bail. These are just some of the difficulties we go through every day, mm. um, be it in Angola where also 
basically the last frontier for freedom mm -hmm. is the internet because everything else the government has uh, been able to control. Um, so, and it, ha it is up to us, African journalists, to talk about our problems more. Like no one expected to see what happened in Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so sometimes we're too entangled in our own problems mm. that we cannot see what is happening uh, across the continent. Mm. And that's what we need to, mm. to change so that we're able to use that network mm. of solidarity uh, to improve on our stories. And many of them are transnational mm. and cut across countries. Um, mm. I want to talk to you. A lot of the focus I've looked at the program is on uh, the Internet research, uh, things like social media, uh, Twitter. Uh, we've seen, especially in South Africa, with uh, a lot of court cases recently, Twitter playing such an important role uh, for journalists. Uh, is that the way that uh, sort of the new media are going? Um, one, because of um, the inability for governments uh, to control that space. Mm. And that's why it has become so, more, so important. Mm. And also because it's much less censored. So anyone can just uh, tweet and give an opinion. Mm. And people want to hear as diverse opinions as they can. So I think it's really important that we invest more on social media. But the traditional media will remain because uh, of the process of gathering the news, of checking the news, mm. uh, which is quite important. Mm. Uh, so, and social media will not replace the traditional media, mm. but it is a complement mm. and a way also of pushing uh, the traditional media to serve the public uh, as the public somehow uh, demand uh, in terms of the perspective of what issues are more important for them. Mm. Uh, looking at uh, some high-risk uh, stories, we, we look at things like Ebola, terrorism and war. Do you think uh, uh, life as a journalist on this continent, um, or do you think the likes of Ebola, terrorism, is being given enough coverage by sort of journalists across Africa? To a certain extent, yes. And um, you also have to be mindful that there's a problem that affects directly many journalists and families. I just received an email from a friend in Liberia mm. uh, saying, well, I'm going through all this process. And um, we cannot at that point detach from the realities of our own countries. Uh, but I don't think uh, the attention has much to do with the journalists, but with the way the media houses uh, are controlled and what decisions are made mm. uh, to provide specific um, coverage for this or that particular issue. Mm. I'll give you one example. In some countries, for instance, uh, with these new uh, events in Burkina Faso, mm. uh, countries that are repressive in nature will play down that news mm. you know, yeah. so that they don't become contagious. Mm. Uh, and that's how sometimes yeah. we try to contain uh, or governments uh, mm. and those who control the media try to manipulate mm. um, coverage. And that's why social media is important uh, in so many countries to circumvent mm. uh, that control of the media by the powers that might be. Mm. Rafael, do you think journalists are protected enough by law? I don't think so. And the major problem is not the law. The major problem is the political will and their ability to also um, expose the governments that abuse the law, uh, be it in Zimbabwe, be mm. it in uh, Angola, be mm. it in uh, Swaziland, which are some of uh, the mm. most intractable cases uh, in the region. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's a problem with the law. Uh, mm. In the case, for instance, when I was uh, arrested mm. uh, last year, I was outside the courtroom. Uh, as a journalist, I'm allowed to cover a trial, and mm. yet I was arrested. Mm. And then uh, the police chief said, well, now you're free to press charges against us mm. after beating me up. Unbelievable. It's just one example. You'll be giving some talks uh, in, the, in the coming days, is that right? Yes, I'll uh, be giving the Carlos Cardozo Memorial Lecture mm -hmm. um, tomorrow.
Excellent. Well, uh, yeah, best of luck. Welcome. Thank uh, you thanks for much. spreading the word in our country and uh, I guess uh, giving more insight to our journalists. Uh, I'm uh, chatting to uh, Rafael Marx uh, de Maurice. Uh, he's a well respected Angolan journalist. He'll be uh, chatting at uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, power reporting three day meeting at uh, Wits University. So we'll keep you updated on uh, any developments that come out of there. Well, uh, opposition and Leaders in Burkina Faso talking about Burkina Faso. They've called a new mass rally in the capital of Ogadougou. Uh, Burkina Faso is preparing for another day of mass protests as opposition and civil society leaders challenge moves by the military to step into the power vacuum left by the ouster of President Blaise Compoare. Now, on Friday, President Compoare was forced to resign as plans to extend his 27-year rule exploded into violent demonstrations that saw Parliament set ablaze. Now, the army has pledged to put in place a unity government to manage a political transition. The military has named a high-ranking officer, Isaac Zida, to lead the country's transition. But opposition and activist leaders swiftly issued a statement warning the military against a power grab, demanding instead a democratic and a civilian transition. We ask to be given some space to work towards putting our country back on track in the interest.